Hey there, it's Jason Gorman from Codemanship with a video about simple design principles for JavaScript programmers. So simple design is a set of um, software design principles that come courtesy of our friend Kent Beck, who you probably most closely associate with test-driven development and extreme programming. And uh, it's a set of principles that we apply to our code um, on a, a very sort of iterative basis. So if we're doing test-driven development, for example, um, essentially every time we get to passing tests, very, very important to keep those tests passing, then we stop and we look at the code, we do a little code review, basically, and um, we ask a set of questions. And it's a kind of a hierarchy of design needs. So the first principle is the most important quality of any software design. Um, and we apply those um, design needs over and over again as a sort of a set of organizing principles. So we refactor the code every time that we need to, every time our code is not passing the tests, if you like, of simple design. And then a design can emerge. Um, now, four principles, it's a hierarchy of need. What do you think the most important quality of any software design is? Of course, it's that it should work. Um, doesn't matter how elegant or object oriented or functional or, or how pure your design is, if it doesn't do what the customer asked for, if it doesn't work, um, then it's the wrong design. Um, and this is evidenced by tests. It's uh, very, very important that we know at every point um, that the, the code is still working. So it's very important to have a good suite of fast running tests. So make sure that your code works before you make sure anything else. No point in doing a code review if your code isn't working. Provided that it works, the next thing that Kent asks us to think about is whether the code is easy to understand, or as he puts it, does it clearly communicate its intent? In other words, can we understand what the code is doing just by reading the code? So we don't rely on comments or on documentation or that kind of thing. As much as possible, we try to get the code to describe itself in terms of what it's doing. So, for example, if you, see a, if you see a block of code and you're like, well, what is that block of code doing and how can I communicate that? We could extract that block of code into its own method or its own function and use the name of the method or function to, to tell the story of what the code does. So make sure it works and make sure that your code clearly communicates its intent, that you can understand what the code does just by reading the code. And there's a whole art to that. It takes a, it takes a long time to you know, really get the hang of communicating through code. Provided it works and provided it's easy to understand, the next thing we worry about is uh, duplication. So the kind of the, the acronym here is DRY, don't repeat yourself. So we look for examples of duplication in the code, um, partly because when we have duplicated code, let's say, for example, we've copied and pasted a block of code multiple times, that duplicates the cost of making changes to the common logic. Um, so duplication in code isn't itself a, a barrier to change. It can increase the cost of changing code. Um, but if you watch uh, my video on, on removing duplication from code and the rule of three, you'll see that also, if you think about it, the opposite of duplication is reuse. And when we remove duplication from our code, we could um, end up introducing reusable abstractions like parameterized methods or functions and classes and uh, and, and, so, and so on and so forth. So a lot of the abstractions in code appear through the process of removing duplication from the code. Um, now, if you jump in too early, there's a chance that you'll basically you'll pick the wrong abstraction. So you want enough examples to see what the pattern is, to see what the right abstraction is likely to be. Um, but of course, if you leave it too late, if you let too many examples of duplication build up, in the zero-sum game of software development, where we have we have limited time and resources, the more time it's going to take us to refactor that, the less likely we'll actually do that refactoring. So there's a kind of a sweet spot there, um, often referred to as the rule of three. Now, that's not a hard and fast rule. Sometimes two examples is enough. And as you'll see in the example I'm about to do, we might, we might get to that. Um, sometimes you need more than three examples to see what the pattern is. But if we kind of average it out, it's around three. Three examples gives us a good idea of what the pattern is, what the abstraction needs to be. So make sure that your code works. Make sure that it is easy to understand, that it clearly communicates its intent. Um, then remove any duplication, bearing in mind the rule of three. Don't necessarily jump in too early. And that will 
Number one, it will it will remove code from your code base, making meaning there's less code to maintain there. Um, but also it will hint at what the design really needs to be in terms of potential abstractions. And this is a great way to come up with the right abstractions based on seeing examples of the unabstracted code. So it's a kind of a more scientific approach to introducing abstractions, as we'll see. Um, and then finally, and this is the, the principle from which simple design gets its name, uh, we make sure that we've done the simplest thing possible. Uh, and again, another acronym here, YAGNI, you ain't going to need it. And we'll see an example of that as well, where I've, I've kind of, by force of habit, added something to my code that it doesn't really need or the customer doesn't really want, um, as evidenced by the fact that we can remove it and all the tests will still pass. Um, and therefore, we've got a bit of sort of, uh, a bit of what, you know, a, a speculative generality. We've added something, we've gold-plated it a bit, and we didn't really need to do that. The more complex our designs are, the, the harder they will be to, to change, the harder they'll be to maintain, because that means there's more code, more complexity. And therefore, we're looking to do the simplest thing possible. Is that really the simplest thing we could have done that would have passed our tests? So, four principles for design. As I said, it's a hierarchy of needs. So, for example, we might remove some duplication from the code, but then we should stop and review that code after we've refactored and go, yeah, but is that any harder to understand? If we've made the code harder to understand by removing duplication or by simplifying it, then maybe we should revert it back um, to make it easier to understand. And of course, any refactorings we do, if, if that breaks the software, if it no longer works, and then we definitely need to revert that back and have a rethink. So as we, we work in our little micro iterations of TDD, as our code grows, we're constantly applying these organizing principles to our code and allowing a design to emerge. Um, and it takes a bit of getting used to. And it looks like a very simple set of principles. You may be familiar with more complex or more sophisticated design principles for for example, for modularity or object orientation, which we'll look in a, in a later video. But you'd be surprised, I think, how sophisticated the designs can be that emerge just from applying these simple rules. It's, a, it's a kind of in the nature of the evolutionary process of these complex systems that very simple rules applied over and over again can lead to, to surprising sophistication and complexity. So there you go, those are the rules of simple design. It'd probably be a good idea if I were to illustrate these um, with, a, with a little example. So let's take a look at a, a little Node.js project here. Um, this is the Mars rover example that I've used in other videos. Just quickly to recap if you've not seen the other videos. The idea is we have a Mars rover that, that sits on an idealized grid of XY coordinates that represent the surface of Mars. And we can send sequences of instructions to turn the rover left or right. So, for example, it's facing north and we tell it to turn right, it'll end up facing east. And to move it backwards or forwards in whatever direction it's facing, we send a sequence of characters, um, L for left, R for right, F for forward, B for back. And the rover executes that sequence. It's very, very simple. Um, but the code, it works, I can promise you that, we'll, we'll see in a minute. Um, but I'm not happy with this code. It fails our tests of simple design, as we'll see. So, first of all, let's make sure that it works. Take no one's word from it. So I'm going to um, run, I've got a suite of mocker tests here. So I'm going to run these tests, 17 of them in total. So we're covering all of the outcomes, hopefully. Now, while we're talking about that, just because your tests are passing, that doesn't necessarily mean, they're all passing, by the way, that doesn't necessarily mean that the code is working. Um, so if you go back to a previous video about mutation testing, if you inherit a test suite and you, you're not sure how much confidence you should put in it just because the tests are passing, then take a look at our, uh, the video on mutation testing for JavaScript um, because that's a way of testing your test, basically, making, making sure that your test would fail if the code was broken. Okay, I have mutation tested this. So I've got high confidence in these tests. And also, um, I have, I'm seeing all the tests are passing, they're all green. So I'm pretty confident that this code works. So that's a tick for our first principle of simple design. It works. It does what it's supposed to do. Now let's move on to the next principle of simple design. Does the code clearly communicate its intent? Well, let's take a look, for example, at this block of code here. What's this doing? 
it's not immediately obvious what this block of code does. Now, in actual fact, what it's doing is it's turning the rover to the right. So I could make that more self-describing. I can make the code clearly communicate that intent, what this code does, by uh, extracting a method. And let's put it in the class. So this is going to be an instance method. And a good name for this, well, it's turning it to the right. So this right rover, yeah. Okay, so by extracting that new method, let's rerun our tests. I, it gives me an opportunity to use the name of the method to describe what that block of code does. And you can see all sorts of examples. For example, if you have an expression, then you think, well, what does that expression mean? Maybe extract a local variable or um, that has the name that describes that's what that expression is, that's what it means. Um, if also, if you've got, for example, we've got a little magic constant there, R, what does R mean? Well, it means right. So we could, again, we could make that more self-describing. So let's extract a constant. Uh, we could make it, well, I'm going to make it global because we might want to reuse this, these in the tests. So make it a module constant. And let's call it right. I'm probably not using a JavaScript naming convention there. Answers in the comments below if you think that's incorrect, but there you go. So if the instruction equals right, then the, we tell the rover to go to the right. So in this process of, of refactoring the code specifically to make it more self-describing, I'm also necessarily breaking this very long, complicated method down. So I'm ticking another box here, which is I'm making it simpler. The parts here are simpler. So there you go. That's the first two principles of simple design. Number one, make sure that it works. Number two, make sure that the code clearly communicates its intent. I'm just going to repeat this for the second block here. What does this block do? Just for consistency, it turns it to the left. So, oops, there we go. We'll make that an instance method called left. Rerun our test. So you always, it's not just make it sure it works once, it makes sure that it stays working. So you're always rerunning those tests. And again, here we can introduce a constant. Let's make it a module constant so we can reuse it left. Again, I don't know if this is the right naming convention for JavaScript. Um, I've got a, a bit of a Java head on today. Um, so there you go. So we're making the code more self-describing, but what about the third principle, duplication? Now I mentioned the rule of three, but in actual fact, if we take a look at these two methods, left and right, they are very, very similar. Now, first of all, inside this method, we're seeing there's three examples of something that looks very similar. In actual fact, I can make it four examples. I can explicitly say there's a fourth option here. So hopefully the duplication will be more obvious. So if the rover is facing west, make it face north. And hopefully that will work. So now hopefully you can see that the duplication is very, oops, no, cannot read property facing. Um, interesting. What have I done there? Turns east to north. That's interesting. Oh, that's because it's left. Silly, Jason. This is why we have tests. I thought that was the, for some reason, I was reading that as the method for turning right. In actual fact, no, west to north is, it's north to east. Well, no, it's east to north. That's it. That's, got very confused there for a second. This will become important in a minute. So it's important to keep that code working and have those tests. Very, very grateful for those tests. So now we can see there's four examples of what is essentially a very similar piece of logic. If you're facing north, face west. If you're facing south, facing west, face south, and so on and so forth. So we could think about how we could refactor this duplication. What's the pattern here? Well, I think, if you imagine we have a compass, and let's make that an array. Of um, and it goes in this order, so north, west, southeast. So if we're turning um, 
Left, we're going anti-clockwise in that direction, northwest, southeast. So that represents the direction of turning. Okay, and the next thing we need to know is where, where in that are we? Um, so if we were to say uh, the current direction and then the index of whichever way we're facing, Uh huh. And finally, what we're going to do is we're going to move it along one. So what we're going to do is we're just going to return a new rover. And for the direction it's facing, we're going to move it along one in the compass. So it's the current facing plus one. Now that's going to work for three of them, but it won't work for the last one. So we've got to make a little exception for that last one, which is that if we're at an index of three, in other words, we're, if we're at the end of the compass, we want to go back to the beginning. So I could use modulus, mod four. So if we add one to that index, so the index becomes four, which is index out of bounds, but if you use the modulus, modulus of that, mod four, that will take us back to an index of zero. Okay, let's just check that that works before I delete the rest of it. Okay, it does. Okay, um, so we no longer have four duplicated if statements. We have a, a single function there that has a more dynamic sort of data-driven solution. And this is where I'm going to break the rule of three because I'm looking at the right method and thinking, hmm, that's very, very similar. The only thing that's different is the direction of the compass. So for left, we go anti-clockwise. For right, we go clockwise. So that's northeast, south, west. So if I were to extract this into its own method, and again, this is going to give us an opportunity here to name this method. We're turning the rover in the direction of the compass. Okay, and I'm just going to inline that because we don't really necessarily need a local variable now. Okay, and one last little, little job here. Let's go to the definition of that. So I'm going to just noodle around with the order of the parameters. So I think the rover should come first. It feels like we want to turn the rover in that direction. So let's make that the first parameter. So as much as possible, trying to make it self-describing while I'm removing this duplication. Okay, so now we've got the left method that does it one way. The right method just turns it in the opposite direction. So northeast, southwest. So I kind of, I, I broke the rule of three here because I, I'm pretty confident I can see what the pattern is. And I think I add something to the code here that is quite useful in terms of documenting. So the word turn now appears in our code. Let's um, move that out of the way. So left and right come first and turn comes after. Okay, there you go. So I've been ticking all the boxes so far for the first three of our design principles. Um, make sure that it works and that it stays working. So you notice I was constantly rerunning those tests. Um, and it's important to be able to have confidence in your tests. So if you're not sure, mutation testing is a technique that can help you gauge how good your tests are at catching uh, bugs, at catching it when you break the code. Um, then make sure that your code clearly communicates its intent. So I've introduced words into the code, like left and right and turn, that were not there before. So it's, it's more telling its own story now, rather than me having to figure it out by reading all those, those example codes, all those duplications. Um, and then I've been removing the duplication from the code. Um, so as you'll see now, there's, there's a lot less code. <laughs> Um, a lot less code, but it is important at this point, whenever, particularly when you remove duplication from code, to stop and review the code again and ask, does that actually make sense? If it doesn't make sense, maybe revert it back and leave the duplication in. Now, finally, 
um, um, from what simple design gets its name. Um, it must be as simple as possible. So is there anything in my code that is not as simple as I could have made it or that is not necessary? You ain't going to need it, Yagni. Now, if we scroll back up, you might have spied this. At the top of the go method here, you will see I'm logging to these files. Let's take a look in my combined log files. So all of these interactions, all of these test cases are being logged. Now, whether or not you need logging is a question of whether or not anybody asked for it. So we had a user store, for example, that said, as, as a sysadmin, I need to see um, a comprehensive log of all um, all the instructions, all the sequences of instructions that our rover has received, then we would have a test for that and we would have, very importantly, we would have a customer test that fails because we're not logging. Don't forget that, that people like sysadmins and operations people and user support people are also users. You're, you're building a system that's for them to use as well. So if they have requirements that would make their job easier, then they, you should collect those requirements from them. You say, hey, what do you need to support this product? And it's very much the whole part of the whole DevOps thing these days that you need to consider people in those kinds of roles. And that may be you as well. I'm, I'm a big believer that developers should support their own software. So it might be you who needs those things. But in this case, for this particular project, nobody's asked for this. I just added it. And I can prove that like this. Let's get rid of that code and rerun our tests. None of the tests fell because I removed the logging. You ain't gonna need it. In this case, no one's asked for it. It's such a small solution and it's not production code. So we don't need this logging. Why did I add the logging? Well, I obviously added it for demonstration purposes. Um, but in the real world, quite often what developers will do is they will kind of by habit add things to their software, like logging and databases and all sorts of things, um, just because that they, they sort of, it's all like a learned behavior, if you like. They've seen other people doing, oh, you must do that. Um, for example, in, in, in the old version of Visual Basic, it was like the habit that for every function you wrote, you would have on error resume next at the end. Well, why? What, who's asked for that behavior? What, will, what test will fail if that's not there? Um, so be brutally honest about your code, everything in the code, and, and if, it, if you can't really see the need for it, get rid of it. Or if you can see a simpler way of doing something, do it the simpler way. Now, a lot of developers find this very hard. Um, let's just, let's, while I, I'll, while I, I'll talk while I'm doing this. A lot of developers find this very hard, removing things from code in particular or deleting code, um, because, we don't need this either, because um, we get very attached to solutions. Um, so, for example, as a, as a younger sort of developer, and particularly when I became, sort of moved into team lead and architect kind of roles, um, uh, I, I read the design patterns book like a lot of people in the mid-1990s and was very impressed by that and used those design patterns everywhere. It's what they call second architecture syndrome. So you learn a lot about software design and design patterns and then you just kind of use them willy-nilly everywhere. Um, it's a bit like if you're a musician, well, I must have all the notes and all of the chords and we must play in all of the keys and all of the time signatures. Well, not necessarily, maybe less is more. But it takes a certain amount of confidence as a developer to do less to do something simpler uh, and i found particularly as a less experienced developers i was afraid to do the simple thing because i felt and very often i was right um i felt that the, the other developers would read that code and not admire its simplicity or its elegance but be unimpressed by how simple it was um that, that must mean i'm not very i'm not a very senior developer because i'm not using the strategy pattern and i should be using the strategy pattern or i should be using factories or should be, I should have added logging, or I should be using um, dependency injection, or whatever the, the, the fashion du jour in terms of design is that particular week. Um, to let go of all of that baggage and go, no, all I need to do is just do that. That's all we need to do. Um, and then allow yourself to be guided in terms of design decisions, one by what is necessary, what does the customer ask for, what do we have tests for that will fail if we don't do this, and two, by, by applying these organizing principles, by allowing the design to reveal itself, by applying these very simple rules over and over again. 
And it takes, number one, it takes quite good refactoring skills, but it also takes a certain amount of confidence to allow yourself to do the simplest thing possible and not be, not be concerned that nobody's going to be impressed by that. Um, I will be impressed by that, I promise you. Um, so there you go. Those are the, um, the principles of simple design. It is a hierarchy of needs, and at the top of that hierarchy always is the code must work. So whatever you do in your design, whether it's one big, long transaction script or whether it's a super-duper modular simple design, um, doesn't matter if it doesn't work. Make sure that your code is easy to understand once you've made sure that it works. That's very, very important because one of the biggest factors in the cost of changing code after our ability to retest it quickly is how easy it is to understand. And there are all kinds of factors that feed into that. For example, complexity and the ease of understanding code are very closely related. There's a very strong statistical co correlation between code that is more complicated and code that developers find harder to follow. And of course, if you can't follow the code, you're more likely to break it when you tinker it with it. And then finally, duplication, partly because if you duplicate code, it means you've got to change things in multiple places, and that adds to the cost of changing code. But more importantly, because that's where a lot of the hints about what the design really wants to be are lying, because the opposite of duplication is reuse, and that's where the good abstra abstractions come from. That's why the best frameworks, for example, are a product of refactoring common, uh, commonality out of code rather than planning a design up front. So those are the rules of simple design. Um, apply to those to your code over and over again. Practice doing that. Uh, and you may be surprised at what emerges in terms of, of design.